Just wanted to pop in quick at the beginning of this video to let you know, yes, this is a very long video. It is only one third of the stream that I recorded from last night, but I may get to some of that other stuff, but it kind of got rambling all over the place. This one hour clip is from Joe Colisari. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He is a commercial litigator uh, that came into the Twitter space that Tex was hosting to give some information, a legal background and information for what people could do about the current MMTLP situation. Not fantasies, not high in the sky ideas, actual, real, legal solutions and options that were before people considering the MMTLP situation. I think this video will be highly informative and help people, give them real solutions to the problems that they are dealing with. And Joe did say that he would possibly come back for future Twitter space as the, he had a limited time and there was a lot to go over and a lot to cover. So this is the one hour that he was here. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. I will make sure to try and get some timestamps in here to get to key points because it is kind of a long video and determine if the rest of the stuff has anything interesting to go over because I do not want to subject you to a three hour video and I don't think you want to be subjected to a three hour video. So I'll just let Joe take over from here and I'll see you guys later. <laughs> so, if well, anyone held hey, this thing, hey, Tex, can we bring Joe up? Joe, can you come up, please? Because Joe yeah, is he... one of the smartest minds sure. on Twitter. He's he's a, he's a lawyer. Yeah, I, Joe. I, I, I don't think I've heard it's like... much more intelligent than him on Twitter. Joe, can you come up, Joe? Joe, Joe. So we have a is it Joe Car Carlos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If he has a minute. Yeah, come up, Joe. Joe You've got a mic. Joe, come up so joe joe here's the problem we're trying to solve i've been brought into this i i don't know anything about it i'm just we're, it's, we're working off of hearsay here right so there's a company mmtlp right who has a class of securities class a securities that nobody can find a registration statement for but a certain Mem certain members of the class were able to sell and but other members have not been able to sell they can't get a legal opinion right but but now we're starting to hear a different thing can you please explain this to joe jo joe is the nobody's smarter jo jo joe is a hundred <laughs> times smarter than me yeah joe so uh, <laughs> what, what i'll say hi joe well, welcome so um that that's not the correct setup um I'll, I'll try very quickly to to give you my understanding and then maybe um maybe uh pb <laughs> you can take over or someone else but essentially what what we're talking mmtlp is not a company um mmtlp was a uh, preferred series a share distribution um from the result of a basically it was a special dividend that was issued from the business combination the reverse takeover of torchlight energy and metamaterials um so metamaterials basically made a deal and they reverse listed into the nasdaq took over torchlight energy what happened was torchlight energy's assets which were oil and gas leases for some some properties they had some projects mint like my oil and gas rights basically were um preserved in this thing that became mmtlp so basically torchlight stock became mm80 that's currently publicly traded on the nasdaq but shareholders eventually got this series a preferred share which at some point unexpectedly became trading on the otc but that never represented a company. That was just the IOU for what would later become a spinoff. And the spinoff essentially was another distribution that occurred in December 2022, where we received common stock for a, for a uh, let's just say a company called Nextbridge Hydrocarbons, which which their their assets are these leases, um, which were preserved all the way through. So. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, at no time was there ever a situation where one group of of holders 
um, could sell and others couldn't with the exception of some individuals who had brokers, maybe like in the, the UK who, who had restrictions on their ability to close positions. So at, at all times, while this was trading on the OTC, the MMTLP um, positions were, were able to be um, closed um, from most brokers, if, if not um, the majority. And, um, there were some restrictions on being able to buy because, of course, um, it was OTC. So customers of Robinhood, for example, could not buy, but they could close. Okay. So you start with the first principles, which is, I know you're calling it like sort of a spinoff or it had an intention to become another company. Um, it has It has to be, even if it's trading on OTC, it has to either be one of two things. Either it can be an actual corporate structure or it can be a division, a subsidiary, or effectively a company owned by another company. And th- plenty of those shares trade OTC. So there's no, no issue with that. So if I had to guess, and I'm just guessing because based on the limited information you give, gave me, um, they, they created an... an they did. A, a, they a, did. A, At some point, they created an entity called Oil Co. Okay. But... You, but the, the the what was trading o- OTC was not actually uh, shares of that oil co. Well, this this is where there's some some vagueness because the company didn't communicate um, <laughs> very very clearly uh, to shareholders. There were a lot in the filings, but at some point we did identify that they registered a, a company called Oil Co. and we suspected it all had to do with this. It was later corroborated, but. Uh, yeah, look, I'm probably not the best to go into the weeds oh. um, around that. So, so yeah, here's, here's the way you figure MM, it out. Can I just, MMTLP stands for Metamaterials Torchlight Preferred. They got the, the, the preferred shares as part of the reverse merger as like a gimme because they were doing this reverse, because Torchlight was doing this reverse merger with Metamaterials. Yeah, so it's a subsidiary. So it's a subsidiary of. Uh, I think. Uh, I think. Yeah. It, essentially. Yeah. Well, what is the? Question? Yeah, actually, at the uh, at the time it was. Oh. Never mind. At the time it was trading, it wasn't a subsidiary. It was strictly just a preferred share. With preferred assets share that the company what? brought of in. What of a company? A preferred share of Meta Materials at the time. Okay. Right. Right. So so okay so. The, the nice thing about that yeah. is, okay, and this is just general, you know, for anyone's benefit or education here, um, not legal advice, okay? But the, the nice thing about when you hold any type of share, okay, any t- if you're a shareholder, um, one of the beauties of that is that you have rights, okay? So if there's any company behind it somewhere, even if it's a subsidiary of another company, you have rights, depending on where it's incorporated in all 50 states, to demand things like full accounting of all shares outstanding, who's in control of the company, the articles of incorporation, uh, the various different um, uh, bylaws that, that could be applicable for the creation of new shares. You get all those rights, even if it's not publicly traded, it's trading OTC. So if there's ever in the future a question of like, okay, well, I want to figure out well, what exactly is the structure, well, how, how, many, how much preferred is out there, I'm trying to figure these things out. You can actually request that. And that's why, you know, in our system, you know, the secretaries of state have all of that information or access to all that information. And if companies do not comply and they don't turn over the records that aren't filed publicly, then you can bring actions to obtain that information. You have a lawful right to obtain it. Wait, Joe, I think we need to back up here a little bit. So when they got MMTLP, when, when Torchlight, when Metamaterials, Absorb. Well, they basically just did a reverse merger to take Torchlight's spot on the Nasdaq. For it, it, that's really all it was. But they weren't trading. Like NMTLP shares weren't were not traded on the OTC immediately after they were issued. They didn't start trading. Does anybody know when they started trading? Yes, after four months. Okay, t- okay. time up. Just step back for yeah. one second. Okay, that's an important. When you say part, they yeah. were when you say they were issued. What do you mean by that? Did you get some sort of notice that it was issued? The company did did say that they issued all of the shares. Okay, but how did they say that? What was the what, what format? Did they what say company? they distributed them? They distribute them. Yeah, it would have dis- been meta distribution. Yeah. Joe, is there is there a distinction between authorized and issued and registered? Yeah, in- absolutely. Yeah, I mean this is this is why you got to be very careful, like step yeah. by step. Okay. 
So like you start with saying it was, uh, it was issued. Okay. Well, what that generally means, okay, is that there was some sort of notice given to people who were in receipt of the issuance. Okay. There has to be, it has to be sort of uh, both ways, right? So if you've got an, a particular notice, you could make the argument that it was issued to you, right? But but if it if you never got anything and the company's just saying we're authorizing the issuance, that doesn't necessarily mean it was issued, right? No, they got they got the dis- okay. Yeah, yeah, we did get the shares. Amy, yeah, they did. Honey, Amy, yeah. honey, hold on, Amy, honey, hold on one second, please. So so Joe, there was no alteration in uh, issued or authorized shares the entire time. So, so would that not depict that the shares may have been authorized, not issued, and registered with the the pre the the previous entity that was that that the company merged into? Question. Well, yeah. I mean, you, well, hang hang on a second. If you're if you're authorizing shares, okay, which companies can do all the time that does not necessarily mean that they're ever issued okay you can you as a corporate board you can authorize the issuance of shares without actually issuing them there can be triggering they events they were okay issued. so tell they me about that they well, got them in their brokerages they had right. them so like, there, there, there oh, is some a, people so this, didn't even really, sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry amy go ahead go ahead honey it's okay they okay so they were distributed to the shareholders of torchlight and they okay. were in, in there, they were, they had them in their brokerages, they were DTC eligible. And so they okay, were great. transferred. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so people had them in their brokerages. Then what's the next step? What happened then? But they were not trading. Like that's, see, this is where the, this is where the waters get weird. So they weren't trading for four yeah, that's months. That's fine. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So then, hey, Amy, when you say they weren't trading, there was no there was no ability no to remove the legend from from the certificates. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there this was no. Real... Sorry, Amy. I, so yeah. part of the big confusion with not trading is they simply the, sh- the 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 securities were issued to all the previous owners that owned Torch. They just didn't have a ticker to trade. So That's everybody right. kind of got off. Yeah, sorry. I, I just, when everybody says they didn't, like, we got talking about rights and people not having rights, it, it really was, there just was no ticker. Right. They, they, they had not, um, like, they didn't, for four months, they were not registered, they were not giving, given a QCIP, and they did not have a ticker. They were just, uh, it just was a number in their brokerage accounts. Joe. Okay. And so, so and it was when you say brokerage account, was it was it on? I assume multiple platforms: Fidelity, Schwab. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah, uh, the various and, the various brokerage accounts. Yeah. Well, okay, but now, hold on, guys. So, Joe, Joe, there is a there is a wrinkle here. The 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 the, the there is a Canadian entity and a U.S. entity. So, Tex, can you get into that, please? Yeah. So, so basically, all of the uh, all of the um, holders of TRCH, which was the U.S.-based NASDAQ-listed company, were eligible for, on, on the uh, reverse takeover, a distribution of meta, one, uh, there was a, what was it, like half a metamaterial stock or two metamaterial mm-hmm. stock, I yeah, forget. You got, a, you got a set, materials and then yeah, they, half they ended of, up, of MMTFP. No, they got they got one MMTLP. So the, the quantities don't matter too much, but they ended up with a, a whatever you would call it, a distribution. So they ended up um, TRCH was cancelled. They ended up with MMAT in their brokerage account and MMTLP. Now, what 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 the little quirk here is that MMTLP did not exist um, until months later. Initially, people were seeing in, in, in their brokerage account some sort of placeholder. Some people had numbers, some people had TRCHP, but it was a valueless, non-tradable um, placeholder because that's what it was intended to be. They told us that this thing would not trade. It was, it was like an IOU. In the event that they made a sale of the oil and gas lease assets, they would give us cash. In the event they did a spin-off into another company, they would give us common stock, and so that that's the situation here. M, the Canadian yeah. company, 
the Canadian company was not eligible for what became MMTLP. They only received a distribution of the MMAT. Well, the, okay. So again, I, like you, there, there are issuances and there's notices that should have accompanied all this. If they didn't, that in itself is a problem. And, and at least in the United States, that's running afoul of the law. But if there was preferred stock, you know, that was distributed, okay, what, what the reason why it might be untradable, you know, is you basically are just getting a beneficial interest in the proceeds of a sale of future assets. And it is effectively a restricted stock offering. That, that, that is what's going on, in, uh, basically, from what I've been able to yes, yes. sort of get pieced together, okay? So, and, and, and you got to remember, with a restricted offering like that, yes, you may have indications of it in your accounts, but because certain conditions need to be met, because there needs to be certain triggering uh, events, it can come to a situation where it is never actually realized. It's just a, it's just a placeholder, you know, right? That's why you said, like, some people have numbers or letters, or whatever in their, their accounts. It's just effectively a placeholder um, where it's tied to a future occurring event. For example, it sounds like this. There was a, the sale, I think you said, of future assets. Like yeah. you say gas, uh, uh, oil and gas. Yeah, yeah. They, they, prom- mm. they promoted this as there would be a sale, there would be a buyer of the leases. Um, uh, it ended up being a spinoff. That's what we saw a couple of months ago. So there, there's a second part to this whole story. We're, we're just at the first part where people received the first batch of people received their entitlement. And then uh, as, as, um, as a couple of people said, once it was distributed, nothing, nothing was capable of happening until months later. It was about four months later, this thing. Yeah. I think the OTC new people came in. Some people got out. Yeah. I was going to say, I think we got him up to that point where we've been distributed our dividend, right? Then a mysterious event happened where suddenly an OTC ticker appeared. All our accounts went from whatever we had originally to this new thing, MMTLP, and people were able to sell. Some were able to buy. And I was curious, like, hey, this is supposed to be like a restricted stock. It's not registered. Why are we able to buy and sell it? And that's, that's where the first mystery began. Yeah, then the there's about a hundred more say. mysteries after that. <laughs> but know? I want to know so that. So, Joe, the question, the biggest question is, who registered it on the OTC? And the the uh, theory is that market makers um, who were short the stock from when it was Torch or MAT or whatever it is got together and got this thing illegally trading. No, Amy, Amy, honey, hold on. So, Joe, if if the if the shares, if the preferred class was registered or 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 authorized, let's let let's use the word authorized when the company with the original company that remember, this was a reverse merger. If those preferred shares were authorized at the time of incorporation. And then somehow or another, just you look like, like Joe, I mean, come on, how many times have we done this? Right. Like hundreds. Right. Right. So, so we, you know, when people look at authorized and, and all this other bullshit and registration, they're looking at common stock. They're very, they're almost never looking at, at preferreds. Right. Okay. Right. So, so if it was done then, would that be the basis for their ability to do what they did or because because what amy is saying not not criticizing her i'm just pointing out you know just something that was stated there there wouldn't need to be another registration statement do you have a comment thank you yeah the the only thing I i will say is that this this sort of thing is impossible to know without somebody pursuing the records and the authorization, because the authorization had to come as an official corporate act, right? It has to be an action of the company. There would be a record of that that's required. I mean, if it's a Delaware corporation, certainly there would be a record of it. But remember, even though it's preferred, okay, you you still have restrictions and conditions that need to be met. So those may never materialize and they're revocable. 
this is the real key, right? So like, just because it was authorized at some point and it was, a, it, you know, you get this preferred offering and it's upon a triggering event, upon a sale or some other condition, I don't know, because I've never seen it. It can always later be revoked. It can later un, be unauthorized effectively and replaced with some future conduct. So but, you, but, but what about self-registration? Couldn't the investor, an institute, a savvy institutional investor, self-register the the same securities or no no because it's not i mean i guess if it if it became uh realized yes it could but you got to remember that it's a restricted we were just talking about it's a restricted offering is upon a triggering event so you can't have it both ways either either it triggered either the event triggered and at that point it was no longer restricted okay or it didn't if it didn't trigger okay then yes the whole thing could be undone by the board but okay, you know, so, I don't know. Yeah. So, so that's the board resolution. Sorry, Amy. Go there, ahead. But there Correct. wasn't, and, and I think that's what, like, that's what you're kind of missing. Like, Aces, I don't know if you came into this tonight, but there's a there's a whole bunch of this. But so it's actually the CEO, the former CEO of Torch, who was doing consulting work for Meta Materials, who says that they never registered this stock to trade on the OTC. They weren't basically saying that they weren't the issuer. I know, but Amy, I don't think the OTC is material. Is it, Joe? No, it's not. But what I'm, what, what I'm saying is that the, the company, the, 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 the person who is in emails between FINRA and I think it was, it was those internal emails with just FINRA, they say that they are the issuer. But, right, but, right, but, but hold on. Is being it, it, the issuer of this, like he's he's saying that he had no part in getting this thing a QSIP. But but it's the broker. Any of the above. It, a, Amy, I I look. I you know I've done hundreds of these kinds of things. Okay, so as an investor, as a CEO, and all the rest of it, who who, who cares, right? But right. So I don't know that Finra or. You know, I don't know that that's material. I think Joe, J Joe would be the best person to answer. Joe, isn't it the broker to where I go to remove the legend or I go to transact something on an exchange? Isn't are, aren't they the ones most responsible for how you know you know th this shit works? I mean, you know, yeah, it, no, that, but, that, but that, they that, have, it had to get registered. It had to, yeah. it had to be an assigned a QCIP number. It had to be um, assigned a ticker, and that has to come from an issuer. Like, Correct. But what, what the you, you can get a QCIP number. Can you, can you get stop a interrupting me? Let me finish. Go. Sorry. The theory, the theory is that the company had nothing to do with this being issued. They had nothing to do with the QCIP number being assigned to it. They had nothing to do with the ticker. So what the theory among the MMTLP people are is that two market makers or shorts came together with the OTC, worked out some kind of backdoor deal to get this thing traded. Okay, but I think it's important no. that FINRA, FINRA stated, uh, wasn't it rule something 15, 15C211? Isn't that the one that FINRA um, stated of why it began trading? Yeah. Well, hold on a second. Where, how do you know that? Where did that come Finra. from? Where do, where, no, no, Finra no. produced an FAQ on Twitter. <laughs> oh, hold on. I'll, where is yeah, that? give where me a second. I'll, yes, they did. I'll, I'll we, post it in just a second. Yeah, sure, but Finra is not, they're, they're, you, they're, Finra is not a priest. Finra, you know, Finra is not a marriage counselor. Finra's, they're just interested in disclosure. Correct. That's right. But they're saying that's why. There you go. I'm going to post trade. it. Oh no! I just kicked myself, didn't I? Hey Joe, is it possible? Leave. Joe, is it possible? <clears throat> is it possible that when the company was incorporated and then first registered long before there was a reverse merger, that these securities could have been registered in some way, some form? Is that possible or no? Yeah, absolutely. This is why. This is why. If you if you were a client walking in, 
right? We, we would want this. We would we would make a record request immediately to get all the corporate records and all of the different authorizations and everything you know that you wouldn't ordinarily get in the public domain. Now, can I can I ask what? Okay, this is from a layman's perspective, like myself. What is the significance of of which which entity registers that? essentially the target for clarification, whether it's torch executives or meta materials, what, what leads you to, to try and identify that? Well, you have, I mean, number one, you have to make sure it was lawful, right? And again, I think somebody made a comment, maybe it was three aces that, you know, the FINRA is not a priest, neither the company either. Companies make mistakes. Companies uh, take actions all the time without proper authorization. They don't, you know, dot the I's and and cross the T's. And there are things like this that happen, believe it or not. And that's why you have relief if you have rights and you have, you know, effective property rights that you can enforce. Hey Joe, I uh, I put the uh, Finra link in the nest, and I also DM'd it to you. Okay, let me take a look at it. But but ultimately, you got to figure out where where the where the problem lies, right? Like what what link in the chain got screwed up, and if it if it truly is screwed up, then there's entities that are culpable. But yeah, wouldn't, so- that, wouldn't that be the brokers? <clears throat> because right, so if I take shares to a broker. And medallion guarantees and all that stupid, you know, all the shit that goes on, right? So, right, it, w- wouldn't they be the ones who are culpable? I don't know that Finra would well, it be. Can be it can be multiple play- people. I mean, it can be you know multiple people and institutions. So, it's never you know, and a lot of times when issues like these come up, it's multiple folks made a mistake. Um, let me just where, where is this posting in the in the nest? Which one is it? Uh, it's it's just a URL link. It says finra.org and MMTLP FAQ, something along those lines. Fire, I don't see it up in the nest. Yeah, I don't see I it don't either. either. Uh, Is it in the comments? You want to send it to... Fire, send it to me and I'll send it to Joe. Okie dokie, one second. Thank you, guys. It's good to have some outside people who deal with this stuff more often than we do. I didn't even know what a preferred share was two and a half years ago <laughs> well you're never you're never gonna get a better resource ever anywhere than joe all right so he's here now and he's willing to take questions and answers go, go to town yeah we appreciate because, it so uh, much i've been doing this shit for 35 years I've never met anybody smarter than him. Well, we're gr- so, really grateful to have your- him in the, in this space. There is um, no people that are we we're here for answers and to pick your brain and to see if you have different insights. So there's no one in this space right now that's going to come up and and just what if they're not going to come up and say they have it all figured yeah. out? Is basically what Joe's I'm your guy. Joe, Joe, ask Joe. Joe, Why I sent you, got- you the I sent you the ask- Finra link. Yeah, let me take a look at this for a second. Hang on. Yeah, and there's there's a lot that that's missing in this this story. They they made several disclosures. They actually screwed up several disclosures with the SEC. Like there's a whole thing to this. But yeah, go over the the FINRA FAQ real quick. Yeah, we've reached the beginning. Then there's a journey that follows. Can you not scare him? Hey, uh, I'll be I'll be back a bit later. Julie, I've invited you to co-host the mics and stuff, so okay. I'll be back. I'll in a be bit. very cautious about who I allow to speak. Yeah, and it just remove people if they take too long okay. or whatever, or if it gets too noisy. Okay. Just like you don't even kick them out; just remove them from speaking. Okay. Swing, I see you have a question. I do. Yeah, go for it. So I'm going to let Joe do his reading. And I want to listen to his interpretation of the uh, FINRA fact. But I also would like to um, rebut once he has, you know, some time to, like, dissect and uh, fully understand what the FAQ meant, said, and then maybe get, you know, a response. So I'll wait for Joe to finish, and I'll just, if you guys are okay with it, I'll sit up here as a speaker until then. 
Okay, great. Does anyone else have any questions for Joe or three aces? And when I say questions, I mean questions, not not uh, statements that you have it all figured out already. Um, I actually do, um, if that's okay. Um, I appreciate you having me up. Um, so I am a share consultant for um, NLBS. It's an OTC ticker. And I'm just wondering, I guess, what your opinion would be on the best way to trap potential shorts, just from an outside perspective. I don't know that OTC is a distinction in in terms of securities law, right? You could have a, a private company that they're uh, they're all, you know, treated the same. Joe, is there a distinction for OTC other than disclosure? And then e- e- even in in the disclosure world, I mean. Is there, I mean, is there anything material there? Sorry, Teresa, I'm I'm reading this. I just want to make sure I'm up to speed on this. Give me one moment, okay? All right, cool. So let me know when you're done. Well, well, can I specify, I guess? Um, What's a share consultant? Can I ask you what that that means? Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what I do is is I, I talk to the CEO and I just, you know, talk about things that I you know, that I believe would help the company, um, basically the share price. Right. But so here's the thing, right? So, and again, I'm going to yield to Joe or Amy or one of the smarter people in the room. I don't know that OTC is a distinction. The, the only thing that OTC means, I think, right. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but is is some form of regulatory closure right so so but but you know otc pink sheets all that kind of stuff it, it comes down to disclosure and disclosure is voluntary so i'm not sure that the the corner of the room that we're looking to to hunt in here has anything to do with OTC, but, you know, correct me no, if I'm wrong. No, understood. Uh, like somebody, somebody just said, Hey, you know, come up if you have questions and MMTLP was obviously OTC. So I figured I'd throw it out there. Thanks guys. No, you know what? We're, I'm not, we're, we're not, we're not, we're not trying to criticize anything here. Right. We're just all trying to learn. Right. So, but, Wait. but right. So, right. So I don't know that I don't know and Joe or Amy or one of the smart people would know, but I don't know that OTC listing, I, I, I can't, right. I can't put my finger on what the distinction is between an OTC listing and a NASDAQ small cap or an NMS listing or whatever it is. So my my thought my thought is is I might be able to 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 do similar things, but it wouldn't be as closely you know um, like like there wouldn't be as much paperwork to do them, if that makes any sense. I uh, think it's all the same. No reporting the reporting um, <clears throat> regulations no are different. I, I I think the distinction is materiality. Right. So so in an OTC listing, if, you know, you're, you know, whatever, a 12 million dollar revenue company and you've got a contract that's, you know, material in nature versus a a contract that, you know, a Salesforce.com would have or, you know, I, 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 I think I think the distinction comes down to materiality in disclosure, not the disclosure requirements, if that's correct. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Like I, I, I think I have a solid understanding, but I just figured I'd, you know, chime in uh, and ask your guys' opinion. So thanks for that. No, I mean, it, you know, we're just, we're, we're all here trying to learn. Right. So that's it. Joe, what do you got? Did you finish? Uh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, guys, this is all, I mean, laid out fairly I mean, clearly here, I mean, they, so, so there's an, there's an amendment and there's the withdrawal of designation that was made on behalf of Meta Materials on December 14th, 2022. They withdrew 
the Series A non-voting preferred stock. The date of designation of the stock being withdrawn was June 14, 2021. It's got a signature from Kenneth Rice, executed fully, and it is uh, certified with the state of, uh, of Nevada. Yeah, right, that's, so that's correct. They we actually would... did that on the ninth and um, future dated it for effectiveness on the distribution date. Uh, to to my recollection, now that that's in reference to um, something different, uh, a different uh, a different uh, time that we've been discussing. So just to make it clear on that point, uh, what that refers to is the um, is the more recent action that took place in December twenty twenty two. Uh, in relation to the spin-off of of MMTLP to become uh, the distribution of the next bridge common stock, what we were discussing earlier by way of context was the initial um, distribution of the series preferred A shares, which then sat there for you know however long I forget what it is one or two years, and then and then later. Uh, we got to that point that you're you're speaking to, Joe. Correct, but how, but were the original issuance was that similarly cancelled? Well, so let me step in real quick. So in June of 2021 is when the merger between Torchlight and Metamaterials transpired. There were a few things that had actually taken place during and after the merger. As a Torchlight holder, you were entitled to a placeholder and in your account whether it been through fidelity or td or schwab or whatever you held in you were entitled to a placeholder that placeholder was in labeled mmat-a it was just a placeholder that's all it was that was in June of 2021. In October of 2021, it became, and I quote, MMTLP. Two market makers, um, and uh, I'm going to use some speculation here. I've been told I cannot prove this. It's purely speculation, but it was GTX or GTS and Canaccord that conspired to actually go to the OCC and they falsified documents to allow that MMAT-A to get a QCIP. Those were done through four memos on the OCC with approximately a dozen uh, revisions to allow it to start trading and it bypassed all of well, the regulatory requirement it bypassed all the regulatory requirements that you would normally expect to see hold, hold on and, a second so so the, i i understand what you're saying and i don't mean to contradict but i just want to make sure we, we give the other side right okay so in this faq which i just finished reading the whole thing the finra claims that the, it was incorrectly classified uh, and incorrectly published its threshold securities list showing that MMTLP met, and this is in October of 2021, that it met the threshold requirement to be traded. So so they're, they're saying it's a coding error, that it was just an error on the part of FINRA. Yeah, but there was, okay, so there's all different requirements that allowed it to actually trade legally. But the problem is when it, this perpetuated from, falsified documentation that was used from 20 mm, yeah, no, I, I just found this is what is on the FAQ it says FINRA had a coding error and that's what happened it wasn't a result of malfeasance or you know uh, that's their, their view you may d disagree and you may be correct I'm just telling well, you that's their position but Joe the scene of the crime according to the the claimants here is whether or not the securities were registered. That's where we need to find is, is the bone. Where, where is the bone buried there? Over to you. Like, yeah, there, and, and, nobody and can point to a document, right? Like, back registration, all you know, all the bullshit. Blockers, four point nine nine, five nine nine, or nine nine nine. You know, all, all of the, the, the bullshit and, you know, the stuff that goes on in the hedge fund community, right? Where, where, 
exactly where were these securities registered. So my my contention is that they were registered, that they were authorized, not issued. Because remember, there's been no material alteration in the number of shares that are outstanding. So, so these securities, right? I mean, again, we're just working off of suppositions here. These securities would have had to been registered way the fuck back long before this quote unquote reverse merger took place. So, so it, it, if somebody can stand forth and say that they have some sort of information related to how and when and whatever it was that they were authorized, not issued. Because we really don't give a shit about when they were issued. What we care about is when they were authorized and when they were registered. Over to you. Well, and you're also talking about multiple issuances. So there's there's different, you know, you've got the July of 2022 which they did file the Form S1. I'm looking at it right now for NextBridge Hypercarbon Carbons Inc. Um, that that is that is a distinct issuance and authorization and registration from the earlier entity that I think Tex uh, was talking about. Right. Can I just um, point out something from an operational point of view? Um, I'm a hedge fund person. Um, I worked in hedge funds for about 11 years as controller and. Um, uh, we, as part of my job, was to evaluate um, illiquid and um, um, unvalued securities. And um, we were a global manager, and we were also a quantitative fund manager, which means we had, on any given day, anywhere between three and 5,000 positions. And um, we would notice at the end of the month when things would become a liquid, become delisted, become canceled, become, and literally after years and years and years of being in operation, we had lists of these things that we had to go out and value every single month. And as part of my job, I had to go around and call people and say, what is this worth to you today? And the problem is, is that if you look at MMTLP and um, you know, the successor securities, they're just gonna say it's worthless and you can't value it i mean it may be worth something to somebody but once it's 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 deemed worthless by um the relevant authorities i mean you're just not ha- you just don't have that much ground to stand on and i'm i'm, I'm re- who, who establishes who establishes the the value of the lands um it, what's going to happen is, is it's going to be you know, I'm not an expert in oil exploration, um, and I'm not an, ex- an expert in terms of how you extract it out of the ground and what the particular cost is. But my understanding is is that the oil that um, is held by NextBridge hyd- Hydrocarbons is held in such a way that um, it's more it's it's uneconomic to extract from the ground. And if that's the case, it's much like you know, the HYMC situation with AMC is that, um, you know, there's gold in them, their hills, but you can't extract it unless you have either a process that hasn't been invented yet, which is what HYMC is doing, or it's so far deeply drilled down that it's, it's ineffective, in a, you know, from a cost perspective to draw it out of the ground. And I've heard this argument over and over and over again, and, and people have been, we've been all been talking about this, and I've listened to you guys for months and months, and I've listened to Wes Christian, and I've listened to all these other guys, and I'll, I, I just can't see, this is, this is one of those securities that I'm telling you, it would end up on my list of things that I have to try and value at the end of the month, and it would be either pennies on the dollar and not transactable or it'd be just worth zero because it doesn't have a particular an intri- an intrinsic value. Correct. All right, can I ask Okay, well, let me ask you this. Can I ask you a question? Wait, oh, sorry, hold on. Go We've gotten a little off the track here. Yeah, we that's, for Joe's can I ask you a question? So we have two of the uh, hedge fund guys here right now speaking. Now, 
have you does it make sense that um there would be two hedge funds that were short the stock that would conspire to get a stock trading have you ever engaged in anything like that or heard about it no because what would happen is is that um, if I knew that somebody else had a losing position, I would actually try and double down and try and drive them out of business. What about you, Three Aces? I mean, I've, you know, the only companies that I've ever tried to drive out of business were frauds. So I can't speak in general terms about you know, some kind of company that, you know, wh whatever the story is. If you want to talk about a specific company. But I'm just asking if it sounds reasonable that. How about legally? I mean, Joe, Joe would know. Joe, is that legal? What, what is what? So their idea. Is for, for two hedge funds to conspire to get a stock trading. Uh, Listen. Well, well. Go ahead, Joe. Sorry. No. So, so okay. So when you, when you say get it trading, right, there, there's a legal process for it to, to, to actually get the QCIP to become traded, to, to recognize. I mean, the, there's a process for this. So when you say conspire, usually cons conspiracies are to do an unlawful act. Okay. And if, if they're just merely a, the, following the legal process, there's no liability there right it's just basically filling out forms and disclosures but if you're doing something nefarious like you're getting something listed and, and being deceptive yeah absolutely there's liability okay, there. swing. that's what that's where you have to draw the line swing what's your response Joe, can i can i sorry can i piggyback on on your on your statement um just because we're talking about getting it traded so in that faq on the the fourth um the fourth point they make how were mmtlp shares publicly quote quoted and traded in the first place the last paragraph there was like this reporting process is separate can you can you like elaborate on their their paragraph there and like break it down in layman's terms like what they're saying actually occurred sure so the, the, and, and i'll just read you a portion of it. okay um they say this trade reporting process is separated from the process by which a broker dealer begins quoting a security in compliance with rule 15c2-11 okay 15c2-11 requires a broker dealer prior to quoting a security to review specific uh, specified information about the company that issued the security unless an exception applies and so so basically what they're saying is the the FINRA you read from the first part they say FINRA does not approve a company's issuance of securities or uh, or approve or determine whether broker dealers may begin trading. However, once a broker dealer executes it in an unlisted security, the firm is required by FINRA to report the executed transaction. So, what it's saying in just basic English is is saying that. FINRA requirements are largely reporting requirements whereby information has to be transmitted on executed trades, okay? So they're not approving the issuance of it. They're not authorizing the issuance of shares. They're not the people actually executing the trades. However, once the trades are completed, they have to get information about that. And then they say the reporting process is separated from the broker-dealer quoting process, which is a separate uh, set of rules. It's 15C2. That's what it's explaining. So, so the quoting process, the approval process, they're all distinct and they're all apart from just what information gets going goes in the way of FINRA. Does that make sense? Right, but Joe, Joe, the, so so the thing that you left out, right? Not you know for whatever reason, was the listing process, and that seems to be where much of the regulatory focus is. You know, let, let's go to Bitcoin and the rest of it. Okay, but so where where does who, who or what is responsible for the regulatory governance for the things that are listed and traded? Is there is there a part of this that has something to do with that? Over to you. Yeah, I mean, that's the SEC, right? So that's the S1. Right. So that's civil. There it is. That's, that's civil, that's what I was right? Saying. But so, can somebody make a claim against the SEC, or or who who would they file? No, because they were instructed. They were instructed in the S one. 
Well, no, no, but who, like that, that, who that was the company? Yeah. The company. Joe, Joe, who's the defendant in that lawsuit? Is it the SEC or the broker? Okay, so in what before you can file a lawsuit, you got to figure out who who screwed up. Okay, right. so you know there are plenty of companies that comply with the letter of the law and get their S one approved and they begin publicly trading. Okay, however. What's later determined is that they falsified records, they fabricated information, right? They were deceptive in what they filed. And then the action would have been those who aided and abetted and completed the uh, fraudulent filings. They had to sign off on that stuff subject to penalties of perjury. So that they're on the hook for submitting falsified documents to get registered in the first place. That's the key. So it's not the SEC. I mean, the SEC gets, I mean, think about how, 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 it's just logic, right? Like, what what is this? What is the process? The process is whereby people have to go before, make their paperwork complete, and then file it and make sure there's disclosures. Okay, this is why. Just to, as a quick digression, three aces. Everybody is saying now, you know, you go into these Bitcoin rooms and they talk about, well, how could how could Coinbase possibly have been listed? How could the SEC have greenlit their S one when uh, you know they're now suing them for selling unregistered securities? And the answer to that is. Because in the S-1, it actually says we don't know what steps enforcement at SEC is going to take to get control of this industry. Regulations all over the place. There's a lot of uncertainty. So we're approving this subject to you disclosing to potential investors that there might be an enforcement action that says we're shutting this whole thing down as an exchange. We take a view that you can't even trade, period. So as long as that disclosure is complete, you know, the SEC from their standpoint is, oh, fine, you can go trade it. It can be public trade. It's not, a, not our problem. You've told investors, here are the risks. So, Joe, Joe can I, like, when going Amy, Amy the before SEC, you go on, so sorry, just one quick thing. So when, when we, we, we use the word listed there, and, and I, I just like to clarify. So when uh, we, if we read the FINRA FAQ, I don't know if everyone can see the highlighted section in the nest. It, it does state, Broker dealers relied on an exception to SEC Rule 15.2C, uh, sorry, 15C211, that permits broker dealers to publish a quotation for unsolicited customer orders. So my my understanding is that correct. they went through a a different process to getting this thing actually listed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but no, you're right. right. But, but but keep in mind that you know the OTC in tr securities trading in the OTC market in many cases there are no listing requirements. OK, they can quote them on bulletin boards. They can quote them on pink sheets like they don't have they don't have listing requirements. Fantastic. Sort of yeah. Yeah. They, this is great. So what, what you're saying is they've I mean, they, they made it. They created a market for effectively in a completely legal manner. How do we go about identifying who did that? Is there any way given there's no form? Well, that was or... my question. That was my question. So, I mean, <laughs> great no, minds think no alike. Yeah, there was no there's no way that two hedge funds could have gone before the SEC with an S1 and said, we want this listed. Like it was the company in their S1 that they filed. Yeah. Is no. that right? Well, it's up to that point, we don't have an S1. If we're, depending which timeline it, we're on. Correct. Yeah. It's in the, it's Guy, in the, it, the it, meta materials. It, 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 it's in the and metamaterials and towards reverse merger. S1. Well, hold on now, guys. No hedge fund in the history of the hedge fund industry, which I spent 10 years in, has ever gotten involved from a technical legal perspective with the SEC. I, Not a I, single I, one. I know, that's my point. Not <laughs> a single one, right? So the only, the only thing, and Joe, please correct me if I'm wrong, as always, that the hedge fund would do was demand piggy right piggyback registration that's all they want they want to know yep. that if the con go ahead joe sorry no i was just agreeing with you yeah cool i'm just saying right it, it, as an investor as a hedge fund investor which i i mean i yeah i've got you know it'd be, be, be you know you were in diapers okay when i when i was doing this stuff okay in the 1991 how old were you five or something Right. So not not trying to be like disrespectful in any way, but I've been doing this shit for 30 some odd years. The only thing hedge funds care about is liquidity. Hey, so it's right. not me so, that's saying that it's not me that's saying the hedge funds did this. I, I, I wholeheartedly disagree. 
I think you when where we should remove. With what I'm Sorry, no, no, Cats, you... no. I hope yeah, I yeah, disagree so... that two nefarious hedge funds got this thing trading. So she let's, disagrees let's, with the no, premise of hedge not, funds it's doing not, it. Honey, it's not the hedge funds. Guys, guys, take it's take a brokers. take a step That's back for I'm a saying, second. <laughs> One second. The brokers, the brokers are the ones who have to take the legends off the securities so those securities can be traded. So if there Ace, is, is a she, party, go. No, she totally agrees with you. She's she's coming from the point of view that everybody um, that who's pro going after Finra is portraying. She completely agrees with you. It's the brokers. If if you walk in, it, 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 Amy, if you walk into Schwab or any of these places, whatever it is. Cases, I'm very that, aware of how this all works. I am agreeing with you. I'm telling you what the MMPLP crowd thinks. This is not what I think. Yeah, go, okay. guys, let's, let's take a step back. So there's like three aces, and Joe don't have the context of the you know community conversations over the last six months or two years. So this is where the disconnect is. I think let, let's remove like hedge fund from from the description because basically what we're getting at is they, there's there's a story here which is being told by uh, in, insiders or ex insiders of the related companies. Um, and they basically said they had no, they they did not authorize MMTLP to begin trading. They they're saying they did not take the steps to to make that happen. That, that's so, bullshit. Because the the, the, the 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 Joe is a is is a corporate uh, 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 securities cor uh, corporate attorney. The only I, way I that those hold, hold on, brother. The only way that those securities could have a legend removed is with a legal opinion. Joe, how how could those investors have removed the legend on those securities without A, the corporate counsel, you know, giving a legal opinion to the brokers, which is a medallion guarantee, all that bullshit. Okay, right. Now, now, the only other way would have been through self-registration, and there are no forms filed. So th this is the corner of the room. Th this is the, the conundrum that we seem to be dealing with that, you know, we can't get a straight answer on. Over to you. Well, look. I, there have been situations where I have contacted and others at my firm have contacted uh, DTC, okay? And DTC can provide information about some of this. They can give you information about the QSIP. They can give you information uh, just, you know, what, what, when, the, when it became eligible for being traded in the OTC market, how it became eligible. Sometimes they'll even provide you communications from those purportedly uh, uh, discussing or, or addressing the particular security. Um, you know, so they have a whole host of information. So if I were trying to dig up information in a serious professional and thorough way i would probably start with dtc right so but joe if if i walk into goldman sachs tomorrow or morgan stanley or one of these dipshits okay with you know a million shares of 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 an otc stock of all things right they you know they're gonna want medallion guarantee they're gonna want uh, legal opinions they're gonna want all this stuff or or, right, I have to self-register under 144. There's no two ways. I mean, I've been doing this shit for fucking decades. There's no two ways about it. So, so how, how does, it, it, let, 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 let's just say that the company, that the, 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 the prior company that was reverse merged into, that this MMTLP and all the rest of this stuff, let's just say that they incorporated and, and authorized these preferred shares. And then let's just say they fucking registered them. Even with that, you, you know better than any other person on earth, you would still need the legal opinions and, 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 and yeah, of course. Absolutely. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, of course. Absolutely. No, you still need legal opinions. 
Right, you okay. need all that shit. So how did this happen? How, how, what, what is the, the legal th- threading of the needle of, you know, again, I don't even know why I'm so fucking passionate about this, but I just, I just I've, I've taken it on like I've adopted this like a, a step. Thank you. Kind of thing. I, I got, I got no, no horse in the race here, but how, how is it? How is it legally possible for this to have happened? Over. Can I answer this, please? No. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> so this is this is a brilliant conversation. I think let's let's let three aces and Joe go. Relinquish when you're done, and then we'll we'll take questions. But I I I love what you're doing here. I think this is this is what we need to really answer. Listen, this is all on Joe's shoulders. Joe, Joe yeah, is the and, only and, and unfortunately, I, I have to jump in a second here. I didn't know it was going to be a long conversation here. But uh, no, I mean, listen, there's a lot of uh, steps in the process, right? And as you move from, you know, publicly traded companies to uh, uh, numerous different ways to bring them to market, uh, OTCs, which are not publicly traded or, or even, you know, private, you know, exceptions that you can apply there, there are a lot of gray areas, right. And, and keep in mind a lot of these, even FINRA, FINRA is a quasi, uh, you know, private organization. Uh, they have their own rules. It's not like you get the FOIA requests, uh, with the U S government and you get the ability to find this stuff out. It can be extremely challenging and difficult. And, uh, you know, in certain circumstances, you know, the best path forward is really to start with those institutions, see what information they'll be willing to provide. If they're not willing to provide, you know, a lot of details on it, there are causes of action you can file to obtain information. Um, I've seen some of those filed uh, against the TCC and others. And uh, you got to you know dig out what you can. Uh, but unfortunately, many times it's just a black box. Hey, so, Joe, Joe, let me ask, Joe, let me ask you this real quick before I don't want to cut anybody off. I'm so I'm sorry, three aces. Um, go ahead. There, there were four merger occurred in June of 2021. Okay, there were four memos that bypassed all the. Uh, signatory requirements of the 15 C dash two elevens. Um, there were at least a dozen addendums to those filings with no signatures, no compliance, no anything with outdated information from 2012. So the story goes that there <clears throat> Were Is two that market speculation, makers. or do y'all have proof of the? Do y'all have the memos? No, we do. We stuff? do. We do not have proof. However, um, when the security started trading in October of 2021, which was approximately four months after, or I'm sorry, June, July, August, September, October, uh, four and a half, almost five months later, in October of 2021. MMAT-A, which was the placeholder, became MMTLP. There were two market makers, GTS and Canaccord. Oh, it that proof that were... into the nest. In, in this space, we have these resources here, uh, and, and we're not going to fill them with speculation. No, that's, no, not specula- no. that's not speculation. Wait, hold that's on. Posted, hold that's posted on, on, on the... There's... Okay, here's, here's the question. Hold on, hold on. This is the perfect question for Joe. This is the yeah. perfect question for Joe. I know, and I'm, I'm trying to get okay. there. But... No, 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 but hold on, Swing. One second, please, right? Is the Joe. speculation yep. even plausible, it, Joe? That's the it, question. Is it even a plausible well, it's, it's, scenario it's, it's, that, that could happen? So, it, so the, the, I'm a little... The con- question con- for Joe is, Joe... Is an options trading exchange who has transacted in securities or, you know, what I guess we'll call them securities, options, right? Is it even material to the issuer, the broker, or anything else? Or, you know, where, 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 where is the bone buried there? Because that, that, this that's, way, that's really what you're asking. I don't think it's material at all, but I, I'm going to yield the floor to Joe. 
Go yeah, ahead. no, I mean, I want to make sure I even understand what the allegation is before I say if it's uh, if it's implausible. Okay, so so what I understood Swing to be saying was something to the effect of that he believed there were documents that were incomplete or falsified, or uh, I, I kind of was not really tracking uh, what okay, he stated. Okay, so just but, real quick on that, so you have the the whole story. The ex CEO John, John Bird has said that these documents were taken from 2012 his signature was forged and they were used in this nefarious scheme to get the stock trading so just so you have some context on that. Just, he specifically just with... said there was old financial data for the, the company well to be more specific it was actually proven um in a court of law that the information that was provided on the OCC documents when Mr. Berta found out that MMAT turned into MMTLP, those financials that were provided on the OCC um, memos, and there was four of them with, like I said, a dozen um, addendums or revisions before it actually became tradable. So from June of 2021 to October of 2021, it's how long it took for it to actually transpire for it to allow it to start trading. So you're saying these, okay, these time, people, time these people hey. altered SEC documents? No, they actually falsified SEC documents and they falsified mm -hmm. the information that was provided when those OCC memos were Who actually... Who are these people? Who are these people? These are private exactly. people? Huh? Exactly, we, we don't know. They had duty in the company. Oh. They had duty to the company. The very oh, oh, no, the very hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. You just said the company, C a former CEO, has has offered some sort of public statement about this. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And did he? Has anyone asked him, or has he said who the documents were falsified by? He doesn't know. No, the, it's, that's that's who, the problem. Who submitted the documents? Who submitted the documents? Well, with, exactly. With, with, exactly. With the 15C 2-11 forms that are required, it, okay, so there's two ways to actually get this listed. A 15C 2-11. Correct. And then there's, a, there's an, an exception, and they were both bypassed, and there were no signatures offered on the OCC memos, one through four. I'm just going to use one through four, but I, be, I believe it's like 4,000. 281, 234. Just throwing that number out there. I don't remember off the top of my head. But those four memos use falsified information to get the security listed from MMAT to MMTLP. It gave it a new QCIP number and it began it began trading in October of 2021. Now the price, um, unbeknownst to anybody that was an original torch light or OG, original gangster, if you will, like a original holder of the Series A preferred placeholder, now all of a sudden, instead of MMAT-A, now you have MMTLP. So, two market makers... Mm -hmm. I can, I, 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 let me interrupt. Can maybe. I please finish? Can I please finish? Sure. Honey, let him finish, sweetheart. Thank you. So... To make a long story really short, and I'm going to cut it short because we've already had this conversation at Lydum. Um, two market makers were the very first that started trading this according to FINRA's data. Not my data, FINRA data. It was GTS and Canaccord. Those four memos with those dozen addendums or revisions eventually made its way not only on the Securities and Exchange Commission, but also the OTC. A FOIA request indicates that it hit their fraud radar prior to its starting trading. It traded from October of 2021 until December of 2022. FINRA steps in and they used a U3 halt. That U3 halt suspended trading. 
Now, the intent was for anybody that was an original OG Torchlight MMA T-A holder was there was going to be a short that needed to cover their short position prior to the spin out. That finite date in time was December 12th, 2022. December 14th, it would be eliminated. So from December 7th, 8th, 9th, 12th, shorts would have to cover. That did not happen. And the reason for it is the U3 halt. Now, why did that happen? Purely speculation. And a lot of people can you know, disagree with me on this. I don't care. I have a very unpopular opinion when it comes to this. I agree, with, I, I agree with what yeah. FINRA did because of the settlement of those shares. I mean, now we're, you have to have time. Here. We're, this is the problem with many spaces is people don't ask questions. They just lay out what they think happened and they don't have an inquisitive mind. Is this helping you, uh, Joe and Three Aces, get any information to help us answer any questions? Or is it all making sense or is that just information overload? Yeah. No, I, I, listen, here's here's something that I can just helpfully, hopefully cool, cool temperatures here. It's an extraordinarily complicated series of transactions, OK, that occurred here. And there is a lot of gray area within the law, particularly the exception uh, to 15C that they're talking about. In particular, that is something that's going to give them a lot of discretion and they're going to give them a lot of leeway in the margin. So I have to jump, unfortunately, on this. But I would say if anybody is really interested in this or you know feels that they were um, somehow wronged by this, um, you, you really should you know, come together in a coordinated way and try to get relief uh, because there are avenues to get more information that carry a lot more weight than people just doing Internet sleuthing. Uh, so in, in any event, I, I apologize. I have to jump here. Well, and, uh, oh I, God, I jump. Joe, Joe, is there a class action here for these claimants, plaintiffs to... I, I think the only real pathway they don't want a class action three there. aces. They don't want a class action. They want they want the two days back that the stock was halted in the U three halt because they believe that there is a significant short of billions of shares that have to close their their shorts and they're going to make a thousand dollars a share. Joe, can I ask you this whatever. question? A million dollars. Joe, can a I share. ask you this question? So they don't want they don't want a class action. Please, they no, want, they want to trade. You. These people Joe. think that they're uh, they're constantly. Hold on, hold on. I'm I muted everyone. Joe, <laughs> I'm unmuting everyone. Joe, do, uh, I'm mindful you said you have to run. Do you do you have like two minutes or do you have to go right now? Asking one thing. I know everyone's got a thousand questions. Well, Do you have to yeah, leave yeah, right I, now I, or two minutes? I, I have just a minute. Okay. I really got to go, I, but go ahead. I just okay. wanted to so, ask you. Ju Julie, go, 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 ahead. go ahead. Um. Okay, so these people's route that they are taking, their main route is to write letters to FINRA, write letters to congressmen, because their path right now is trying to pressure Congress into pressuring FINRA to do something. Do you see that as a viable action or way to get resolved absolutely not there, there is zero chance of that having any success because finra is not going to have the legal ability to uh well i mean they, they could theoretically file a suit but they don't have the standing to redress the type of injury i think people are complaining about so that that's not it, now that may provoke a rule change right so if your goal is merely that i got gypped here there's a problem with the process and I want some uh, new safeguard in place to prevent this from happening again, then yes, go contact Congress, go work channels through FINRA as a public service. That's a good thing. But if you so let me ask you this real quick, let me ask you this real quick. And I know you got to go. So in the event that there is a congressional subpoena or a federal court that mandates the release of the blue sheets in regards to MMTLP, do you think that there that has any legal standing whatsoever, and this cannot be resolved with the release of those blue sheets, Mr. Joe? No. 
Before you answer oh, that, oh. The, the fraud investigation by uh, in the FOIA request that they got from FINRA, the fraud investigation was on the issuer. Yeah, can you tell this us, is can way you tell too us much. who the issuer is? Can you tell us who the issuer is? Joe, Joe, Joe I'm, actually, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna say this. Like, uh, let's no more questions for Joe. Like, uh, I mean, I love questions and answer, but Joe, w would you be willing to to come back and and give us a little bit more time in the future in, well, in yeah, a couple and, of days? And you know, no problem. And yeah, and I'd be happy to come back. And also, I can do my own diligence. I'm, I'm reading some stuff on the fly here, which is always dangerous. Yeah, it's so. re really difficult for you. And look, we we bounced around because we were f focusing a lot of our attention on how did this thing get uh, to trading, and then we're jumping to telling you about the U3 halt. You know, one year and plus later. So um, let, let's collect our thoughts, um, and you know, ev everyone everyone can contribute one, to that. Yeah, the issue question. question. I'm, I'm going to jump everyone. Thanks so much.